All right. Well, before we close the show up, a little wild card for all of you, because we've talked about this, and it's kind of been an AEW-themed program today, the way it's turned out, and we won't do that on the drive through We're going to talk about SmackDown and Crown Jewel amongst the frivolity we have on the drive through so that'll kind of be a WWE-centric review program, and then questions from the Cult of Cornet members, but this just came out. Uh, or at least I just saw it. It's from the afternoon, uh, Friday afternoon. That's where, so it's, it just came out. But anyway, um, Dave Scherer over at PWInsider.com has written kind of an editorial piece in response to a question that they received. And, you know, we quote PW Insider a lot because they don't have a dog in the fight. They report what goes on, and Mike Johnson or Dave Shearer often will answer questions, give their opinion, which is clearly labeled as such when they do. Uh, they don't engage in the whisper campaigns, and the they don't just take one side's narrative. They think for themselves. Mike Johnson is a very, very unconfrontational fellow. He's fair to everybody, but they don't bullshit people. And in the interest of full disclosure, and Brian, I think you know this, Mike Johnson is the one that contacted me and said, well, I just want you to know, Jim, that a guy named Tony Khan is going to be contacting you, and he really is a billionaire, and he really does own these sports teams, So, and he wants to start a wrestling promotion, because they knew that if some guy that I'd never heard of called up and said he was a billionaire and wanted to start a wrestling promotion, he'd never get me on the phone. I don't think you've ever revealed that publicly before. I, d I don't know that I have, but I, d I don't think the NDA covers who gave him my phone number. <laughs> I don't so think it does, no. I don't believe I got Mike in any trouble, but it, it, the point is they're not an anti-AEW organization over there. Uh, they, they facilitated that connection because they're interested in the professional wrestling industry, but they're not on anybody's side. But having said that, Dave Shearer wrote this column, and since we've made some comments in this program and on an ongoing basis, I, I thought it would be interesting to see what another learned person in the wrestling journalism industry has to say about what opinion he's formed based on what he has learned. So this is on, again, pwinsider.com. It's from Friday afternoon at 2.39 p.m. by Dave Shearer about the AEW investigation and related incidents. If Tony Khan would have only been transparent and shared with the media the details of the investigation, we wouldn't have to piece together what happened. For a man who loves doing two-hour media scrums after five-hour pay-per-views where he can say how great everything in AEW is, he has no interest in sharing the details real reporters and their readers or listeners want to know. And just watch his painful interview with Ariel Hawani if you doubt that. Since Tony won't share any facts, all we can do is surmise things we know to be true, as well as add in what has been reported in quotation marks. So here goes. From what I have heard and seen, the investigation was a farce. Even if we ignore that it took two months for the crack team of sleuths <laughs> sleuths, to figure out what happened in a five-minute incident, any legitimate investigator would interview every single witness. They wouldn't cherry-pick the people who would give the company, in this case Tony Khan, the finding that they're looking for, especially when it involved officers in the company, as three of those under investigation were executive vice presidents. Clearly... Talking to A. Steele's wife about what went on would have most probably contradicted the outcome that Tony Khan seemingly wanted, so according to reports, she was ignored. Why? Unless she and her husband were paid a sum of money for their silence, it seems pretty clear that her story would not have allowed the EVPs to come out looking like the victims, which no fair person could ever say that they were, since they barged into Punk's locker room uninvited. You can make a case that Punk was more wrong if he threw the first punch, but the Jackson boys were also wrong for going in there in the first place, especially when you consider that they are officers in the company. 
which I know a lot of the AEW-friendly media doesn't seem to understand or chooses to ignore to fit their slanted narrative. The irony is that while Khan was sitting next to CM Punk at the scrum, shaking his head in agreement to most of the things Punk said, like a marionette puppet, and even flat out repeating what he told Forbes that he himself was wrong for not publicly correcting the false story that Punk held back Colt Cabana sooner, he gave the appearance that he supported Punk, all while his star was unprofessionally eviscerating his company. He never contradicted him or made any attempt to stop him at the scrum. I guess after the fact, he did a 180. Maybe Chris Jericho and the EVPs got in his ear as we are now suddenly hearing stories from AEW-friendly outlets that Punk was a locker room cancer and Jericho put on his Superman suit and gave Phil Brooks a stern talking to after the altercation. Of course, for the first two months after the incident, Jericho's supposed leadership and hero heroism was never mentioned. It very well may be untrue, but hell, so was the planted punk got Colt pushed off TV story, and look at all the damage that one caused AEW. This one could do just as much damage as Khan seems to have chosen an almost 52-year-old Chris Jericho and the EVPs, those with the distinction of losing hundreds of thousands of viewers from the start of Dynamite until their segments aired at the end of the shows. But again, if the goal was to find the EVPs innocent and punk guilty, mission accomplished. And that kind of, from a third party, from a, a unrelated incident, or from an unrelated person, gives an outside view of the looking in of the incident and how it doesn't reflect well on the company or the investigative process. But Dave goes on. Well, can I, can I let me oh, jump go in? Ahead. A few, a few go things. ahead. Please. Because he's very right about that. And look, everyone gets accused of taking a side. There are people who think we're just on CM Punk's side. In this case, I, I think that you have to pay attention to his side, too. You can't just dismiss it because your favorite wrestlers got their ass kicked. I think it is important to point out that some of the things he said here are really true. The Chris Jericho narrative of wrestling history as it happened has been disseminated widely since AEW started. No bad reviews of any of the bad segments of Chris Jericho matches or angles or promos in The Observer, ever. Not one. He's had a lot of bad moments in AEW. He said, good moments, let's not lie. None of the bad moments ever get called out because Jericho plants all this shit with Dave and everyone fucking knows it. The locker room knows it. Everyone knows it. It's not subtle. So all of a sudden we are seeing a spin appear in the Observer. Oh, the, this is certainly taking a different tone on PWInsider.com as was taken in the Observer last week. But anyone who was involved or anyone who was there, in the immediate aftermath, everyone thought Chris Jericho was a clown. He was there putting on a show after the fact. He could have run in that room. It wasn't like he didn't know what was happening. It wasn't like he wasn't nearby. He chose to not run in that room. He chose to stand back while everything happened. He, he, was smart enough, he was smart enough to let everybody hang themselves. Listen, I don't care what happened in that room. Jericho already knew he was going to go right to Mega and Tony and insist on Punk being fired. I promise you that. Jericho knew what he was going to do. He could have gone in that room. Instead, he waited for everything to play out, and then all of a sudden he emerges. One of the biggest bullshit artists in modern wrestling, Chris Jericho. The Young Buck side, everyone knows Dave's completely compromised when it comes to anything concerning those guys, because they're his guys. So I think that's important, but this investigation, and I don't know how much more Dave talks about it, but I'll just say this here. Everything we're hearing about a third-party investigation, who is the third party? Is it a law firm in Chicago? Is it a law firm that does business with the cons or has done business with the cons? That's the most important thing that has not gotten out there, as much as A. Steele's wife being talked to, which is an egregious thing to leave out of a investigation, the person in the room who wasn't throwing punches, 
The person in the room on the couch who saw everything. Let's not talk to them. I want to know who's doing the investigation. Is Mega Parik involved in the investigation? In any way, is she involved in the oversight of the investigation? Is she, is she investigating or is she being investigated? See, the, none of these questions, and Dave Shearer is right about this. And look, I understand the idea of not wanting to air all your public info, all your company info publicly. Tony does throw Have a lot of stuff of out there. Have any of the people that got investigated been given a copy of the investigation? Is there a copy of the investigation? Is there a document that has been generated that has the findings of the investigation? And if so, who's seen it? And do the people involved even know what's going on? Because we, we, keep, we kept hearing that all of these people heard nothing from AEW. I hadn't even thought about this until right now, but did the investigation take into account that Tony Khan has publicly talked about thinking conflict backstage is good? That things come out of the owner of the company is on the record saying that he thinks good things come out of backstage conflict and look at everything well, good that's come out of it this year. You mentioned that. Let's go back to Dave Shearer because this, uh, the next paragraph, the question of why Punk acted as he did is pretty clear. Tony Khan lets the inmates run the asylum. Hangman Page goes off script and shoots on Punk on promo. Punk then shoots back. It was a perfect time to tell the wrestlers to knock that stuff off. He didn't. Someone, in quotations, plants a lie to AEW-friendly out outlets that Punk forced Colt Cabana off TV. They run with it, even though Cabana was hardly on TV anyway, and when he was, it was in a comedy group. It fits the apologist narrative, since they like the EVPs and hate Punk, so they run with it. What does Tony do? Nothing. He lets it fester and then much later admits he was wrong. Brilliant. What led Punk to blow up? These events and many more. When he said he worked with children, I think he nailed it. Now, Punk is seemingly being forced out of the company for, I guess, starting a fight. That isn't allowed in AEW, unless Sammy Guevara attacks Andre on Twitter and then Andre hits him at TV. I guess if you invite Tony to your wedding, you can get away with stuff like that. Too bad for Punk, he is already happily married. That goes into a lot more of it, too. Tony, as a manager, as a general manager, as the owner, as the promoter, did nothing. And then they finally have a meeting where Jericho could pretend he's the hero, and then Omega insults the locker room? That was the meeting! That was the meeting to try to get everyone to come together! I wouldn't <laughs> hire eight out of ten of you! So, the problem is Tony. The problem is not going away, so it's about everything around Tony. But again, going back to this investigation and everything with Punk, this was all allowed to play out. And I think when you look back now on the series of events, and again, a real investigation into this would have to look at all these things, it kind of seems like there was a hit on Punk from the very beginning from certain people. Like well, were, and you... Go ahead. They were just waiting for the opportunity. And thankfully, we got a good year of TV and wrestling out of it, but... I feel like there were people trying to get him from the beginning because they really didn't want him there, and we know why. Well, and, you know, one of the EVPs would hire Riho, but not CM Punk. All right, continuing with Dave Shearer, because this brings up the activity. He says, I love the AEW-friendly narrative that was all Punk's fault because he allegedly threw the first punch. I don't know about you, but if I just called out three pro wrestlers and said, if you had a problem with it, come see me, and then they angrily burst into my locker room uninvited, I would think they were there to get a piece of me. I sure wouldn't let that happen. I would go down swinging too. If you don't want me to hit you, don't burst into my locker room. Add in the fact that these guys are also officers in the company. They were arguably more wrong than Punk because they should realize that by doing what they did, they give Punk cause to sue the company. No one was right here. They shouldn't have burst in and Punk shouldn't have hit them. If they come back, he should come back. And if Tony chooses them over Punk, Khan should be paying him a sizable chunk of the Khan fortune to not wrestle for AEW. And I believe he will because Punk has all the leverage here. And then we get into this past week's Dynamite. So on Dynamite this week, Dave says, Colt Cabana was on TV against Jericho. 
At least one AEW apologist said that proved all along that Punk kept Cabana off TV. Good Lord to be that clueless. I won't get into how wrong that person was today, but the fact of the matter is that Cabana appearing on TV was an F you to Punk. It can't be seen any other way by a sane person. Was it Jericho's idea? Was it Khan's? If I had to guess, I would say Jericho suggested it, and the head booker went with it. It doesn't matter in the end because it was a firing him on his wedding day kind of thing to do. So unless hell freezes over, it looks like Punk is done with AEW. Maybe the reason Khan sat at the scrum apparently agreeing with Punk and certainly not shutting him down in any way was due to the fact that he knew Punk was the company's biggest draw. After all, he had made that extremely clear to reporters at earlier scrums. In the moment, maybe he was thinking like a businessman and let his top star vent about true issues that he himself had caused. Maybe, despite Punk's unprofessional way of delivering the message, he also heard the truth that Punk was speaking and realized it was time to get the backstage environment under control, you know, like in WWE. Then maybe once he got away from straight shooting Punk and back among the more savvy wrestlers who know how to push all the buttons that Khan loves to have pushed, he changed his mind. Or maybe he just likes owning a wrestling company and being a booker, which he can do with his family fortune. And I, I just want to stress, I don't think it's just the EVPs or Jericho. I think you can't underestimate how much he puts into what Mega tells him. And he's hearing it from Mega, too, because she's on their side. Well, and Dave continues. Actually, he refers in the next paragraph. He says, now it's Dixie Carter, Vince Russo, TNA, as far as an alternative to WWE. And, you know, I mean, he goes on, and everybody should read the whole interview, but basically he closes with the paragraph that Business is down. The chaos in the backstage area and the loss of not just the EVPs, but punk and the terrible booking that led into that all-out pay-per-view and the terrible booking since then has done damage. And, you know, asking the question at the end of the piece... Obviously, with all signs pointing to Punk being gone after AEW putting Cabana on television in that match against Jericho, simply to give him the middle finger and for no business reasons whatsoever, EVPs are going to be back, Punk is gone. Will this be the finger poke of doom moment? Have they finally shit the bed? And I'm, I'm saying this, not Dave Shearer. Have they finally shit the bed in such a fashion that people, have, except for the diehards, which ain't enough, as we know, to support everything, have they run these people off? Are they going to give them another chance? Or is it just chaos? And then the question that we've asked, are they ever going to be able to get serious top talent to go there again when they've set a pattern that even if you go there and draw money, have great matches, produce ratings, whatever. If the EVPs don't like you, then they're going to bury you and make your life miserable. That could be a double whammy that Tony Khan ain't going to be able to pull himself out of. Talent don't want to come, and the fans are pissed off. There is a lot of what you just said there that I think is important. You know... With the EVPs, the other thing is, everyone who wants to take their side, how are they going to feel when the EVPs leave? Are they going to feel the same way, that Tony made the right decision? I mean, Punk's injured. And quite frankly, I mean, that has to be talked about too. Punk got hurt again. We don't know what kind of future in the ring he would have. There is something to be said for that, in terms of what decision you make and who you keep and whatever. But we don't know how long Omega or the Bucks are for AEW. Jericho ain't going anywhere because he's never going to get the power he has in WWE that he has with Tony Khan. He'll well, he's under it. contract till he's 66 anyway, but no, you're right. He will never give this up willingly. No. 
No, no, no. It's going to be kicking and screaming to get him to give it up. But here's the thing now. Where where are the other EVPs? Where are they going to go? Because if AEW is no threat to the WWE, which now I think they've established that it's not, then they're not going to pay big money for either the Bucks or Twinkle Toes. Because as we've said before, the Bucks, they only offered them anything to for the billionaire and the upcoming wrestling company that they didn't know what it was going to be like, they wouldn't have them. They might try something with Kenny, but he would literally have a mental meltdown in that locker room because of his personality. The other guys would just nail him to the wall every day and he would be miserable and he'd go out of his mind. Plus, physically, he would have an issue. That's the other thing. Physically, he'd have an issue, too, getting cleared or whatever. But, I mean, I I can't imagine him subsisting, even in the nice locker room they have in the WWE now with, with you know, <laughs> oh, God. So, anyway, they ain't going to go anywhere on purpose, only if they have to. And 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 another comment that Dave makes in this editorial, in Tony's world, friends matter. It appears that after time had passed, he thought, sure, Punk's a draw, but he's not my friend like Jericho and the EVPs. Friends yeah. matter. He doesn't get high. To Tony. Well, there you go. Yeah, he's straight edge. So he couldn't hang out with Tony after hours. Punk couldn't. Right. So that's the thing. Friends matter to Tony. Now, when he finds out some of these people were only his friends because he was Richie Rich and Cadbury cooked a hell of a fucking lunch he might be hurt but that's you know when we grow up we all have to find out these things that's the saddest thing we criticize aew and you've had personal dealings with tony khan i haven't uh one-on-one -on -one at least but we criticize aew i don't criticize him as a person i think from everyone i talk to they all think he's a really good person he means well even when sometimes he does the wrong thing. I don't know if Punk feels that way right now, but a lot of other people do. But sometimes you hear from people who are frustrated there, and it's almost like they feel bad for him because he doesn't realize some of the people he's listening to are playing him. Whether they are or aren't, I don't know. I mean, that's, you know, Tony could probably decide that on his own, but that's one of the things you hear. Like, I feel bad. Tony doesn't realize he's being led down the wrong way. Hey, at least he's made it longer than Gordon Scazzari did. Well, anybody can do that. I was there for that one. He just had a pack of checks in his hand. Not even a register, just a pack of checks. Here, I need this, Gordon. Oh, sure, wrote checks, just handed them out. If you're CM Punk and you saw Cole Cabana on that show, why wouldn't you at this point? They're just fucking with you. Why wouldn't you smack the person who's fucking with you? I mean, it's almost like the locker room fight, actually. You know someone's yeah. fucking with you. Now they're doing it right in your face. That's From my personal experience, that's when someone gets smacked in the fucking mouth. Well, earlier in the program, that's why I said they, I mean, he can't smack him because he's not in the room. Uh, but you can sure sue him. And that's what, apparently, they don't give a shit whether Tony gets sued or not. But they don't realize that if he decides to sue again, and I'll close the show after this. He's going to sue every You sue everybody that's involved with a situation. Everybody is named. And then you go about conducting depositions under oath. And there's a wide variety of things that can be talked about in the process of that, in, in, as long as it pertains to the individuals involved. Were any of the individuals involved, do they have any habits that might cloud their judgment? And lead them to do things that sometimes people wouldn't do if they were of a level, un, unaltered mind state. Is there a record of the executives acting this way towards other talent who are not CM Punk? That's another question that might be brought up. Or a question of exactly what is the hierarchy here? And since everybody from... The ne guy next to the person next to the top on down was part of the invading horde in the, into the locker room. Do we have a severe conflict? I mean, the whole thing. It, you, you could, 
my God, this is a, a, a attorney's dream to take all these depositions. And then even, even if it's sealed, even if it's sealed, it all goes in writing and people know about it. And, and that's the way things spread. I was going to say, if Punk really wants to punish them for what they're doing to him, try to fight it being sealed. Let everything get out there. Let everything get out there. Let all the info emerge. That's what AEW doesn't want. That's what they're fighting more than anything. Well, and that's why I thought that Tony'd be smart enough not to poke this bear until he fucking paid him off and sent him on his way. But the EVPs and uh, the the canned ham in charge, Chris Jericho. <laughs> hey, if Punk is the cancer of the locker room, does that make Jericho the COVID of the locker room? I don't know. I think he's more like tuberculosis. He's an old fashioned disease. <laughs> it's really out of out of favor at this point in time, but he's trying to make a comeback. All right, should we just close the show up on that one? Chris Tuberculosis. <laughs>